to be a face attached to the term Iron Woman. It would have to be hands down Joan Crawford. She is regarded as one of the greatest actresses in Hollywood history, and she believed so herself. She was dramatic on screen, but off screen the drama was on a whole other level. Crawford was a loved and despised woman in her time, and we will delve into her on and off screen achievements to see what made her that way. The mission of Oscar's leading ladies is not to focus on only the bad or only the good things of these women, but to examine what makes them so spectacular and what made them qualify to win Oscars. And there was certainly something spectacular about Joan Crawford. Just like Ginger Rogers, Joan found out her acting talent in dancing early on. Although coming from a Southwest harsh background with a constantly remarrying mother, the fatherless Joan, who would meet her biological father well into her adulthood, once and never again, knew that she will be a star. She threw away her boring, menial jobs, college studies, and set out to win a dancing competition, then join a chorus line, and finally packed her bags to Hollywood land in her late teens. In a matter of three years, from 1925, when she was 19, to 1928, Joan started carving out her acting career in silent films. Our Dancing Daughters, that came out in 1928, was Crawford's ticket to fame. Once talkies came into fashion, so did Crawford, who had signed with MGM to star in such films like Untamed, Grand Hotel, Sadie McKee, No More Ladies, and Love on the Run, all throughout the 1930s. However, Crawford ran into a hurdle by early 1940s. A new wave of actresses came to Hollywood, Vivian Lee and Ingrid Bergman included. You must check out my earlier videos about them too. Not only that, but Crawford was not as fresh-faced and youthful as the others were, and she realized something must change in order for her to stay as a priority. So she left MGM for Warner Brothers and was cast in her biggest role yet, Mildred Pierce, in 1945. This performance challenged Crawford's acting abilities, and she loved a challenge. Bette Davis actually turned down this role, but Mildred Pierce earned Joan the Best Actress Oscar at the 1946 Academy Awards. She said this as her Oscar speech. Whether the Academy voters were giving the Oscar to me sentimentally for Mildred, or for 200 years of effort, the hell with it. I deserved it. Her pay raised astronomically, and so was her star status. She was paid half a million dollars for her role in Humoresque in 1946 as part of a three-picture deal. Previous Oscar winners like Louise Reiner, Vivian Lee, and Jennifer Jones detested this kind of label and lifestyle and made it known that they wanted to be out of the spotlight. Crawford knew how to be a celebrity. She knew that in order to be on everyone's radar and on every producer's mind, she had to be the star that she always wanted to be. She knew to call publicists, paparazzi, and reply to fan mail religiously because it made her more than just an actress, but also a public figure. In fact, in 1946, she was ill and could not even attend the Oscar ceremony to accept her statuette. So she hired photographers and journalists to come to her house and take pictures of her, all glammed up, in her bed, holding the trophy. A true definition of a celebrity. A diva, really. Once Joan made it known that she is here to stay in Hollywood, the high-earning actress went on to star in more successful films like Possessed and Sudden Fear, for which she got nominated for the Oscar two more times in 1947 and 1952. Since her legendary comeback in 1945 for her portrayal of Mildred Pierce, or even possibly earlier, Crawford and Bette Davis were always arch rivals. They would bicker at each other's acting skills, personal life and looks. Actually, they were very much alike. In fact, their life stories, their temperaments and acting style was very similar. That is why this rivalry lasted for many years. They were always up against one another for roles. 
However, during the 1950s, Crawford once again hit a low in terms of work. But 1962 brought two most prominent things to Crawford. First, she and her arch rival Bette Davis were co-starring in the classic called Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Can you imagine the media stir this caused? The two cinematic icons slash Oscar winners still held animosity towards one another. They tried to withhold their cattiness on set, but they knew that this bond on screen would become a hit. The second big moment in 1962 was Crawford's advance to become the first woman of Pepsi Cola's board of directors. This position was earned when her fourth and final husband, Alfred Steele, the CEO and chairman of Pepsi, passed away. You might remember the scene in the screen adaptation of the memoir written by Christina, who was Crawford's adopted daughter, called Mummy Dearest. Faye Dunaway, also an Oscar winner, played Crawford in this film. There is an iconic scene where Crawford confronts the Pepsi board of directors. It's a very powerful, yet indicative display of how fiery and confrontational Crawford liked to be. This ain't my first time. You forget the press I delivered to Pepsi was my power. I can use it any way I want. Crawford was far from perfect, morally decent and pleasant. She stirred a lot of drama. Crawford starred in a multitude of diverse films and diverse characters for which she was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars and when she passed away, she left nothing for her children that she adopted since she had not had any biological children. Crawford was abusive, erratic, OCD with her children and ultimately left two of them out of her will and testament. In fact, she voiced her disdain for other actresses in public like Marilyn Monroe, Norma Shearer, with whom she starred in The Women, Greta Garbo, and of course, Bette Davis. As you can see, these highly praised, almost worshipped actresses were neither wicked nor virtuous, often behind their incredible performances and achievements in and out of the acting realm. These women had drama even more shocking than the films they starred in. But let's not disregard Crawford's talent, beauty and strong will that gave every major actress in Hollywood a run for their money. As an MGM screenwriter said, no one decided to make Joan Crawford a star. Joan Crawford became a star because Joan Crawford decided to become a star. Here you are making your 74th international picture, a picture that will be seen by millions of people all over the world. Many of the people that you've worked with, talented as they have been, have not survived. What is the quality that you have for the public that makes it go on wanting to see your pictures? Well, first of all, I'm stage struck, and I think they all know that. Secondly, I try to get a film that has audience identification. Um, Joan, I hear a rumor around that you're going to retire after this picture. Are you kidding? Who, me? <laughs> Never. <laughs>